Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, as we lurch from one Johnson-shaped disaster to another, I'd like to pick up on his outrageous attempts to brazenly break international law again. An update with the likely reason he's actually doing it, never mind why he says he's doing it, and how the House of Lords and the EU are preparing to take action against it as the political temperature rises on this issue. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So three things in this video. One, why do I think that Johnson is doing this when he cannot possibly succeed? Two, what is going to be done domestically? And three, what are the EU planning to do about it? So the first of those, why is he doing it? Now, all sorts of reasons coming up, all sorts of things being bandied about, but it, it surely is down to the ERG. Now, this is the hard Brexit group within the Parliamentary Conservative Party. It's a big old block of Conservative MPs. Absolutely has the power to bring Boris Johnson down. Now, they supported the withdrawal agreement. They voted for it. They pushed it. They publicly campaigned for it. Um, but apparently... It was on the understanding that Boris Johnson would not comply with it. That's what he told them. This has been confirmed by at least two Conservative MPs who are very senior members of the ERG. Sir Bernard Jenkin, who's been doing the media rounds recently, and Steve Baker, the former chair of the ERG. Boris Johnson promised them that he would tear it up, that the withdrawal agreement was just a vehicle to get Parliament to go along with our exit from the EU because Parliament would not countenance a no-deal Brexit. So we'll have the withdrawal agreement, that'll placate them, they'll vote it through, we leave the EU, and then I tear up the withdrawal agreement. And you can imagine what has happened. It's not too much of a stress to, uh, you know, a stretch of the imagination to suppose that. So what happened was the first half of the year, I mean, all was well from the ERG's point of view because Boris Johnson kept denying the realities within the withdrawal agreement. People kept saying as well, look, there's things in the withdrawal agreement you need to implement. You don't seem to be implementing there. And then what happened round about summer is people started, you know, laying it on a bit thick. Johnson started to back down, started to admit some of those realities, started to put things in place. Michael Gove's department started getting ready to implement bits of the agreement. Um, checks at the border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, for example. So now we're into the last few months. The ERG have obviously tapped Boris Johnson on the shoulder and said, what's going on here then? It would not surprise me to learn that what they've essentially done is said, look, you said you were going to tear up the withdrawal agreement. We're not messing about anymore. Either that's what's happening or leadership challenge right now. You're gone. And, uh, and I think that's what's happened. I think that's what would explain his behaviour now. Uh, indeed, although the internal market bill, which is the offending bill, is going to break international law, and the government have admitted that in Parliament, it apparently doesn't go far enough for the ERG. They're still not happy with it. Even as it is, it's not obvious that it would still get through Parliament either. I mean, a lot of people are just assuming that this will go through Parliament because Boris Johnson has his majority. There are Conservative MPs who are not at all happy about the party subverting the rule of law in this way. It may well be that put to a vote in its current form, it would be defeated. You know, it only needs about 40 Conservative MPs to vote against it. I always say like 50 just to make sure. Um, that, would, that would finish it because the opposition MPs would, of course, vote against it. But this isn't just a case of Johnson doing what he's doing to please the ERG because they're not pleased. They're still not happy. You know, they have said that they are going to put forward amendments to go even further. The so-called breaking of international law in a very specific and limited way, which apparently makes it fine, is about to become law breaking in a very major way. In addition, in addition, sorry, just on that point where, you know, the government's trying to argue, well, it's OK because we're only breaking the law in a very specific and limited way. That has already become a bit of a meme in legal circles. So there was, uh, I saw on Twitter, uh, a report from a court where a defence counsel 
acting on behalf of their client, who was pleading guilty, by the way, uh, asked the judge to bear in mind in sentencing that his client had only broken the law in a very specific and limited way. Um, and also, someone from the Institute of Government was saying that British diplomats should not be surprised if in future when they read the Riot Act to their counterparts in, in other nations where they're breaking international law, that the response back will be, yes, but we're only breaking it in a very limited and specific way. In other words, we're completely losing our moral authority over this. But I don't know how many Conservative MPs will vote against this bill in its current form. I can't, I'd like to be able to say, look, there's, there's no way that, you know, there'll be fewer than 50 Conservative MPs against this. There has to be at least that many. It would be disappointing for it to only be 50. But there has to be at least 50, surely. But I don't know that. But I am going to guess that the numbers are certainly not going to be there to go any further with it. So I, I cannot, I really cannot see the ERG's amendments getting enough support in the House. Um, what would they do though, threats wise? Because surely Boris Johnson would, would whip against those amendments, but would they? This will actually be a good test case to see if how much power the ERG have over Johnson, because when they put those amendments through, Boris Johnson will either order his MPs to vote for it, vote against it, or give them a free vote. If he gets them to vote for those amendments, then the ERG have got him under their thumb. If he tells his MPs to vote against it, then he's maintaining some measure of authority. If he tells them it's a free vote, then he's just absolving himself of all responsibility. Uh, so that'll be an interesting one to see. But I... I I struggle to believe that Conservative MPs will support those amendments that make the, the bill even worse. What would the ERG then do? So if the bill, those amendments are defeated and it comes time to voting for the bill in largely its final form, what would they do then? Would they vote for it? I suppose they'd still have to vote for it because it's still breaking parts of the withdrawal agreement. But anyway, let us say that this bill in whatever form but still in a form that breaks international law, passes through the Commons. Because obviously other MPs will seek to amend it to remove the aspects that break international law. Let us say that it passes through the Commons in its current law-breaking form. And it looks from the timetable like we're not. this isn't going to be strung out for a long time, and it can't be for a start because the transition period is ending very quickly. The clock is, is ticking. So... It doesn't look like Boris Johnson wants this to hang around in the Commons for very long. It looks like it's being rushed through. Um, and then it will go to the House of Lords. Now, the House of Lords is the unelected chamber. They scrutinise it. They suggest amendments, things like that, when they're not happy with it. The House of Lords will not accept this. Now, I want to draw a distinction with the withdrawal agreement bill in January because they weren't happy with that either. So Boris Johnson changed the withdrawal agreement bill after the general election in, in, in many ways. It was, it was completely different to the one that was promised in the general election. Now, the Lords did add amendments to it because they said, look, no, this isn't acceptable. This isn't what you promised. We're amending it. And then they sent it back to the Commons. Boris Johnson immediately sent it back to the House of Lords. Now, at that point... Um, the House of Lords then let it pass through. They didn't raise any further objections. They just passed it. They've made their protest. But there is a convention in the House of Lords, because it's not elected, of not blocking legislation linked to a manifesto promise. Because our system of democracy, such as it is, is based on the notion that a manifesto promise for which a government achieves a majority has a democratic mandate. They don't block those. This is called the Salisbury-Addison Convention. However, the opposite would be true of this bill because the manifesto promised to deliver the withdrawal agreement. This bill seeks to overturn that promise. So the Lords will be not only free to block the bill on the grounds that actually doing so helps the government keep its manifesto promises, but they would be duty-bound to because... The convention says that they need to support 
manifesto promises. So blocking the bill, or at least amending the law-breaking aspects of it out of there, would be the way they do that. Do not expect this to pass through the Lords. Also, what then? So they amend it, they remove all the unlawful aspects of it, send it back to the House of Commons. So at that point, Johnson has a choice. He can either accept those amendments or he can send it back to the Lords and say, no, no, I want it back in its original form. Um, now, at that point, the Lords could just accept it. No, because they, the, the convention doesn't exist here. They'll send it back. And what you'll end up with is a parliamentary game of ping pong. Now, yes, people will point out that Johnson can force it through the Lords. Yes, but he can't do that in this parliamentary session. He'd have to wait for another one. That will take time. Um, that can't possibly be done before the end of the transition period. So it would, the Lords can absolutely, and I, I, it's not even just me saying the Lords are going to do this. There are reports coming out that they intend to do this from Conservatives in the Lords. Um, the Lords are basically going to block this. This is not going to end up on our statute books this year. So um, it's not going to happen. Now, this is why I say I can't see this happening and I don't understand why Boris Johnson's doing it when he knows it can't come to fruition. It would be incredible enough for me to think that enough Conservative MPs will even let it, let it pass through the Commons in its current form. And absolutely ridiculous to suppose that the House of Lords will allow it. It will not become law. But then there's the international response because the intention has been made. Boris Johnson has signalled his intention. So the EU are also gearing up to take legal action. Now, the European Commission has been considering this and has sent its assessments to individual member states. So this assessment says that the UK's attempts to override elements of the Northern Ireland Protocol represents a clear breach of the withdrawal agreement and allows them to take legal action. Now, there was the question of whether <clears throat> does the breach occur when the bill is passed into law. In other words, the breach hasn't occurred yet. They have to wait. So apparently, according to reports, according to their assessment, legal action can be taken before this point because even proposing the changes that this bill, you know, will, will force is enough to constitute a breach, according to presumably the Commission's legal advisers. Now, obviously, this needs to be tested in court, just as any legal opinion ultimately has to be tested in court. Uh, but the legal action doesn't look imminent. So it doesn't look like they're going to rush to it because the communication from the Commission suggested that the legal action would take place when the bill is adopted, even though it could be beforehand, but that they wouldn't be ready to do so before the end of the transition period. It says that the case is unlikely to be brought before the European Court of Justice before the end of the year. However... They can bring a course, uh, a case rather, uh, you know, to the court um, in retrospect. So they've got, they can take up to four years um, after the end of the transition period to bring cases relating to the transition period. So what then could the court do? So let's say at some point, Boris Johnson goes ahead with this and he forces it through and he sticks by his guns. Somehow he's still in position to be able to do this and Conservative MPs go along with it. Um, ultimately, what could the court do if the UK does not play ball? Initially, of course, it will demand that the UK play ball and pay reparations. There'll be a fine, usual thing that courts do. What will it do if the UK refuses, um, refuses to respect the judgment? Well, we don't need legal experts to tell us this, do we? I even said as much yesterday. We see enough of it on the international news. We know exactly what will happen. The court, through arbitration, could then ultimately impose economic sanctions on the UK. So that is the situation as it exists at the moment. All extremely messy. Um, but like I said, I, I one, cannot expect this to be supported domestically. And two, you know, when it goes to international court, even though that process could take a while, it's ultimately going to hurt us badly. But that is the situation as it stands. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.